um, thank you everybody for uh, being here. Um, I was um, really happy to be able to have been asked to uh, set up a women in science session. Um, my focus for this session is I look around uh, in a particular region where a conference is and I look at the research that's going on and select out women who I see are doing really interesting, uh, exciting work and then contact them and beg them to come because they're always very busy. Um, I've selected women uh, researchers here, as I said earlier, who are working in a variety of areas of large science that have all stemmed from uh, genomics work that have now led to all sorts of ways of looking at food security, at looking at detecting a disease, at new technologies, um, and uh, metabolites, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, metagenomes for understanding the gut micro, uh, microbiota to see how it might implicate uh, issues with aging, disease, obesity, et cetera. So these are the, the, the talks that I've chosen to sort of embrace the entire area. First though, you get to listen to me talk about some of the issues and why I think that um, it's really important for all of us to embrace putting a hand out to reach to the people who aren't always represented in the international community and the issues that um, a lot of, uh, women researchers face, but I need to also highlight that although I'm talking about women in science, this is not a only women are having a problem. Diversity at conferences and in scientific laboratories and universities are terribly, terribly imbalanced. And if people are not able to interact in an international level, you cannot participate in scientific policy. You can't participate in pushing an agenda that helps your particular groups. And so this is the battle that I've chosen, which is helping women in science. But anytime there's a way in which the things we're doing also can help promote other people who are in a similar situation, who are not being heard, this is when you join together because I think collaboration, as Fred put it, is always always the best thing you can do in the sciences. Okay, there we go. Um, I'd like to highlight uh, this young woman um, who says, uh, we cannot all succeed when half of us are held back. And I highlight the point held back because when you're keeping someone from going somewhere, from getting to do something, you are holding them back. And so what's really, really fantastic about this young woman is that she won the Nobel Peace Prize um, at 17 years old, promoting women's uh, health and, and uh, um, uh, equality issues. So um, it's one of my, people always have heroes um, that are older than them and mine tend now to be younger than me. So what are the benefits of having diversity in science? First of all, when you have a more representative workforce, uh, you investigate a more diverse range of questions and problems. And that means that you are then allowed to experience finding out information about every part of the world, not just your per particular circle. And science is about inclusivity and helping everyone uh, across the globe. Another thing is, is when you have a more diverse workforce, it brings new ideas, new viewpoints for tackling difficult, difficult issues. Furthermore, demographically unrepresented researchers actually innovate at a higher level than individuals who are in the majority. Now, it's not because people in the minority are smarter, we are, but um, it's actually that in order to succeed, institutions force you to do more. So they the minority ends up um, it, um, innovating at a higher rate. So first of all, I just wanna give some of the primary challenges for women in STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So some of the things that women face are um, explicit or implicit bias. And explicit is when women aren't smart, et cetera, and people just say that. But implicit bias is more difficult because you don't even know that you are looking at someone and thinking, that's not a scientist. And so they have tests where you look at pictures of things quickly and you say, scientist, not scientist, scientist, not scientist, et cetera. 
And depending on how long the delay is, they can tell whether or not you're like, I'm not immediately recognizing that. Implicit bias is very hard to fight. Um, a hostile work environment. This is actually why I left research. The bench was just being around people who were constantly belittling you and going after you. It, it's why would I stay in that field? Um, nearly 50% of women report being the subject of workplace harassment. And to be clear, I'm not talking just about sexual harassment. Harassment is anything that makes your workplace uncomfortable. So, um, and then the, uh, the next difficulty is this stratified promotion system, which I mentioned with regard to minorities innovating at a higher rate. Um, and that's because women have to do more and more in order to receive a similar raise or promotion. Women receive fewer grants. When they get a grant, it provides less money. They also receive fewer awards and those also provide less money. And then finally, there are reduced inter uh, opportunities to interact with peers on an international um, level. Case in point is the places that you get to interact on an international level are at international conferences, courses, et cetera. So women in science by the numbers. First of all, the greatest focus for a long time has been trying to promote young women to get into the STEM fields. But the fact of the matter is this has worked super well. And the number of women entering STEM fields is, is um, greater than 40%. Obviously there are certain areas like physics where women are trailing behind significantly. The life sciences tends to be closer to 45%. What really is the problem is that women leave the STEM fields. Women who start out in tech intensive industries leave for other industries at much higher rates than men. 53% of women who have entered STEM fields leave compared to 31% of men. Almost one third of the women in the US, 32% and in China, 30% plan to leave their STEM jobs within the next year. Now, I wanna highlight that this does vary by country. Um, and women in Brazil and in India are in, um, in the low 20%. So this is actually how things are working in women in science. It's a, it's a what's called a leaky pipe. And that there are particular points during a person's track through um, as they progress through their career where you lose people. And the biggest, um, the biggest impact is when women get married and when women have children. After that, it starts to be um, things that where women aren't promoted at a similar rate. So if you look in a, most uh, companies and institutions, if you look at how many junior women are at the lower levels compared to how many senior, you do not see a similar uh, percentage. So, Things have been really drastically changing over the last decade, which has been wonderful to see. Institutional programs have been uh, fully invested in to reduce workplace harassment. Um, what was When I was in graduate school, how a university dealt with if you were having problems in the lab was to move the women to another lab rather than discipline the professor so that the woman would have to start all over again. That was when I was like, no, nah, I'm out. Um, institutional policies on managing harassment have been invested invested in. There's training for implicit bias. And actually, you should read a lot about implicit bias. I was absolutely fascinated by how I thought about things that I thought, no, I'm not biased against that. I was like, whoa, yes, you are. Um, there are a lot of legal protections for women now. And what I really need to highlight is all of these changes have been instigated by external forces. No university, no company said, oh, you know what, this is a problem. It only turned out when people got together and, and pointed it out. And that's why it's essential for everyone in the community to be involved in promoting change. Um, the international conferences, I know Juan Ming always wants to beat me up about this, but international conferences are one of the primary places where um, in, uh, researchers can interact in scientific discussions, decisions, and policy making. When you're a speaker at a scientific conference, it increases your visibility, it increases your reputation, 
It increases, uh, it is one of the best ways to make connections, collaborations. And so if you're not on the stage at some point, people effectively don't know that you exist because you know we don't have uh, pop-ups on YouTube showing our paper. Um, so being a speaker, basically at an international conference allows a researcher to really become part of the international dialogue. Now, women have been significantly underrepresented as conference speakers, and even as, especially as keynote speakers. And up until 2010, the number of women speakers on average at international conferences was 20% or less. Over the last decade, made, the majority of international conferences have made huge progress in making sure to have a diversity of speakers in different venues. It's only been, though, over the last five years that international uh, scientific conferences have begun to have true equity between men and women. Equity in terms of uh, uh, other areas of diversity, such as race, uh, global location, et cetera, lag far behind. Um, this is just an example of um, four different big uh, virology conferences that I want to show that in 2001, these were the number of male speakers, the percent of male speakers, this was the percent of female speakers, and you can see by 2016 and, 20, uh, and 2021, you see this final convergence where in all of these conferences, you start to see an equal number of women uh, in, um, and men uh, speaking on the stage. So there's, that's why I, I'm not like complaining about like the world is evil and mean. Um, things have been changing and it's very, very exciting to see. Um, and that's why I'm not happy a lot of times when I see 20%. Um, now, until international conferences include diversity of speakers of all types, we are not going. We are going to continue to have disparity throughout the world. Um, so it's all of our responsibility to ensure that the entire international community is engaged in our scientific discussions. And one of the things that I usually do is what I call check before you accept. And when people ask me to speak at a conference, I say, what is your percentage of, of, of diversity in your conference? And for women, if it's not 30%, I won't speak at it. Um, I have a wide array of information on how to improve diversity at your scientific conferences. If anybody is interested in me sending them information on the best ways to do that. Um, okay, so one of the things that has moved things along is out with the old. Um, when I started in graduate school and all the way up until recently, I was at a conference and I said, this is the last time I go to a woman in science workshop, uh, is the same exact thing happens. There's a one to two hour panel of uh, on the issues and all of them provide literally, if I taped it, I would just play it over and over, three statements as the recipe for success. One, get a mentor. No information on how, what makes a good mentor, how you could do this, just get one. The second, promote yourself. Again, no information on different ways to achieve this. Mostly it's speak up. Well, some people are shy and there are a million other ways to promote yourself than just walking up to someone and saying something. And then I don't know why, but they always say, just work hard. And I'm thinking, well, don't the guys have to work hard too? So I, I've never understood that. But now what's going on, and one of the things that's really been promoting things is this, um, the new networking that's going on. And one of the organizations that I love was uh, created by 500 women scientists, and it's a grassroots organization that provides a whole series of, um, of, uh, uh, of uh, programs and uh, resources that foster um, long-lasting men mentorships and career building and resources. One of them is called pods, which are these localized communities like Shenzhen could set up a community of female researchers who meet constantly and improve each other's work. And they have them all over the world, Africa, China, South America, US, um, it's all over the world. Um, they have fellowships specifically to promote young women and they have training they have wikathons where people start to write up information on a variety of areas in science. They have groups called Sci Moms, where so women who are mothers and scientists can come together to help support each other and figure things out. And then they also work heavily on women rights issues. 
Um, there's a ton of databases. This would be the kind of thing that I would send you where you can find women researchers to identify women conference speakers if you don't happen to know any. Um, it is hard to find them because you never see them talk. So these are really, I use this, the databases. There's a database called Request a Woman Scientist. And it's set up to address <laughs> issues called mantles where all the men are, are on, on a panel uh, uh, talking about work. Um, and then it's also a really great aid for finding uh, female speakers. But what it is, is it's a curated information that is multidimensional questionnaire that gives you a lot of information about women researchers. And people are no longer just using it for conferences. They are now using it as a database to look for potential good candidates to work at your university. So there are a ton of these things. If you're having trouble finding someone, if you're interested in some work, if you're interested in mentors, this is a great database to go to. Um, the thing that I've been doing at BGI is um, a full day conference that's only open to women. This is what Juan Mig has been talking about. Um, and the, the reason it's only open to women is it provides a diverse range of talks, much like this session, which is me talking about women, and then the rest of it is science, is we have research presentations, we have grant and paper writing training, we talk about common issues that women in STEM face, um, there are graduate student and postdoc presentations, and the goal is to combine scientific presentations and information on how senior women researchers can overcome, have overcome their difficulties, how to find a membership, uh, mentors, interact, and improve the tra trajectory of your career so you're not leaking out. So everything was going great until COVID. The COVID-19 pandemic made it absolutely clear that for all the improvements and advances that women have seen over the last decade, there's one area that has effectively been completely ignored. And there is that is that there is little to no support for women in managing their responsibilities outside of work. Women bear the largest proportion of responsibilities at home, including childcare, elder care, and homework. Um, and so, at the loss of, of every support system to aid women in this area during lockdown, women's careers effectively came to a halt. And so what that did was that hit right at this point where you are building your career, where you also have mostly uh, children, you're also just getting married. And so it hit right at the time when you are supposed to be your most productive. So childbirth differentially impacts women and men in the workforce. After having their first child, 43% of women left full-time jobs, twice as many as new fathers. Household responsibilities are also differentially uh, impacting men and women. On average, women spend 8.5 more hours per week on childcare and housework than men. Women in a single parent household, which is often women who are um, in the lower income uh, uh, the arena, um, spend nearly twice as much time both working and trying to take care of their children. During the pandemic, women who were in two parent households spent more time on childcare and homeschooling did the men. And women were more likely to reduce their working hours and change their schedules in order to accommodate family than the men. So what happened then, and this is why it's impacting women now, is there was a decrease in the number of manuscripts submitted by women and the number of articles published by women as first a corresponding author dropped. The reduction in publications correlated with the time spent working from home. And the proportion of female authors then increased again after end of home working. Um, so women production rates were 17% lower than men's in 2019 and 24% lower in 2020. The biggest impact was on the women who were working in early and middle phase of their career. And this is the time, as I said, when this is what you need to do to establish your career. You have to do everything you possibly can. And the dice are already stacked a bit against you. So this is why there's long-term career damage to all of these women from the two years of home. The article publication advances in the laboratory are your key measurements for career advancement and funding decisions. A loss of publications and productivity doing a two-year span at the prime time that you're trying to get uh, 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 enough material to advance your career to get grants 
are basically gone. A pause in a project because you couldn't work while your international colleagues were still working on a particular project put your entire lab behind because you cannot catch up, you can't get your papers into high impact factor journals, et cetera, because other people have already completed their work. Um, and then basically what it comes down to is unless new mechanisms right now are put in place to assess the productivity of women that happened during the pandemic, they will not be able to catch up for a generation or more and you will lose a generation of women in science. Um, Uh, oh, and uh, the other thing is, is, and this is actually key beyond that, is that we really have to change the metrics for measuring success as to whether someone should be promoted or not, if it's only based on a momentary period of productivity. So my conclusions are that equality for women in STEM has slowly been improving, especially over the last decade. It's actually been very exciting. But a major impediment, which the COVID-19 pandemic laid bare, is that the structure of our workplace and the criteria for advancement remain blind to gender imbalance that our society places on women outside of the workplace. Um, and the advances, unfortunately, that women have made over the last decade have effectively been wiped out because of the COVID pandemic. The absence of policies to support women scientists who commonly have more home responsibilities than their male peers, equality in the workplace for women is not possible. So institutions and funding organizations have to dramatically alter their career for career advancement for women uh, for at least the next decade in order to, for people to catch up. And institutions and funding organizations need to reassess and change their requirements for advance for, for women unless they want no more children in the world. Um, I wanna especially thank Drag Mirka Jovic who uh, helped me, actually she found most of the data for me. She, it's always good to have someone really smart uh, doing all the work. Um, and so she's my co-author on a decade of giga science, uh, women in science. Uh, the article is, is published in the 10 year anniversary issue. And she also is my co-organizer for the women in science. And then of course, I have a fantastic team, male and female, and uh, um, at the giga science team who are all extraordinarily hardworking in pu pushing diversity, both at conferences, but also in publishing. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for listening.